Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to MassDEP's second virtual community meeting on the clean heat standard. I am Christine Kirby, a MassDEP's Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Air and Waste. And joining me tonight from the agency are Will Space, Emily Lamb, and Josh Cook of BAW's Climate Strategies Group. And we also have Deneen Simpson, MassDEP's Director of Environmental Justice. I'm going to now turn it to Josh to cover the meeting logistics. Josh. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. To minimize background noise, attendees have been placed on mute. Please enter your full name and affiliation if relevant uh, as your name. Uh, the screenshot on the screen will show you how to do that. Uh, there will be opportunities for clarifying questions throughout the presentation, and in the latter half of the meeting, we'll be dedicated to receiving substantive questions and comments. To ask a question or provide a comment, please raise your hand. Alternatively, you can put a question in the question and answer uh, function of Zoom. Uh, if you raise your hand, we'll unmute you, uh, and you can speak, and then we'll uh, lower your raised hand. Thank you, Josh. Uh, you'll see the agenda here today. I want to note that our main focus for today's meeting is to provide an overview of mechanisms to address equity in the design of the Clean Heat Standard Program. And addressing equity is a key issue and a, a big priority for us as we continue to develop the clean, the clean Heat Standard with your input. So we want your feedback on the mechanisms presented in our stakeholder document and any ideas you may have in addition to what we've included there. But before we get to that, we'll provide some updates on the, the clean heat standard process. And just of note, we will leave plenty of time for your questions and comments after the presentation. And we certainly welcome your questions on other topics on the clean heat standard beyond what we're going to be focusing on here tonight. Next slide. This slide shows our current stakeholder input process and our schedule and for virtual excuse me, virtual community meetings. We will hold sessions every four to six weeks. Our next session in August will include a summary of the technical sessions. And you see here the schedule for the upcoming technical sessions. And again, I wanna note that we will welcome your comments at any time. And your comments can be sent to our climate strategies email and that's climate.strategies at mass.gov. And I'll turn it now to Will. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, so first, a quick preview of the technical sessions that we have scheduled for next week. So we got from stakeholders a request to hold uh, sessions on several different topics, and we've combined them to three different different sessions um, by combining some of the related kind of things we heard about. So on Monday, we'll have a session um, dealing with com compliance flexibility and what's called banking of, of credits. And we'll talk more about that when the time comes. And then also a particular flexibility mechanism called the alternative compliance payment and how you might set the level of that payment. Okay. Then on, on Tuesday, we'll focus on calculation of credits, um, including um, by technology and also um, dealing in particular with hybrid system credits. Um, I should mention that this session isn't about necessarily which technologies will count or be eligible for crediting. It's more about technical issues with crediting. And then finally, um, the last topic will be uh, issues related to mass save coordination and measure verification, which are the other two topics that people had asked to hear about. I should mention that these sessions are not intended to be um, you know, very detailed technical sessions where we resolve these issues, but more just to set a baseline of understanding based on what we had in the stakeholder discussion document and the comments we've re so, re received so far to help set a, um, um, a sort of a baseline for further discussion and, and commenting. Next slide. Um, so this is a slide we showed last time, but we've added a few things to our clean heat standard uh, web page. Um, already had descriptions of the clean heat standard, the discussion document, things about comments, several white papers about technical issues. 
The items marked with an asterisk on this sheet are new, new things that we posted since the last virtual community meeting. So one is, um, you may remember at the last meeting, I think we mentioned that we had posted a video, a short video to help people get an understanding of what the clean heat standard is. Um, and by the same group that, that made that video, which is the author, the Regulatory Assistance Project, the author of the appendix to the climate plan that sort of got us started with this, um, has also written a two-page summary that we, we specifically intend to translate for people. We don't have those translations now, but the idea was to have something short that, short that could be translated into languages that are common in Massachusetts. We've also posted the slides and videos from the, the June meetings, um, and we you know, intend to keep doing that and posting the videos, including for this meeting, um, after each meeting. And then you can go ahead and register for those technical sessions next week now on the webpage, and we'll be posting the slides uh, later this week in advance of those meetings. Next slide. So we also, this is also a slide we looked at previously about next steps that may happen in 2023. The new thing I put up here, we, we've put up here is that we um, we, we are, are entering into these technical sessions and this, um, this um, topical session about equity mechanisms. And we've gotten some questions. We, we've said, and we mean that we're open for comment basically any time but some people suggested it might be helpful to have a, a deadline for another round of comments. So we're thinking here um, that the end, it would be good to get comments related to this round of stakeholder meetings by the end of August so that we can consider them as we work on the fourth bullet here, which is sometime in the fall having a straw program design kind of proposal. You know, at this point, I think we understand the need for us to give you a little bit more to react to as far as your commenting. Um, then just a reminder, the other two things coming along are the fuel supplier emissions reporting regulations, which we already posted some um, possible language for that requirement, and then the concept of delving early action credit and concept um, focused on electrification. Next slide, Christine, to introduce the next section of the presentation. You're on mute, Christine. I get it. Yep. I said at the beginning of the call, we are very much um, putting equity as a priority for inclusion in the clean heat standard. Um, and we're thinking about it as we design it. And the meeting tonight is really important to get your input. And we're just going to go through what was in the stakeholder discussion document. But I want to mention that we want to hear other ideas that we may not have covered in that document. So we're open to any of um, your ideas and hearing from you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Will to go into the, the mechanisms in, in a bit more detail. Great, thanks, Christine. So um, in order to understand what the particular mechanisms is, you need some basic kind of understanding of what a clean heat standard is, which we you know, understand is a little bit hard to, to um, wrap your mind around sometimes. So we're, we're continuing to try and improve our explanation of that. So this is from the new two-page summary we have sort of describing a clean heat standard as sort of three related parts. One is the, the agency, DEP, puts forward a regulation, so requirements. And basically the requirement has requirements for heating energy suppliers uh, like oil or natural gas. Maybe that'll include electricity also. And that require basically that requirement there is to make them implement clean heat services, um, for example, heat pumps in, in different locations in Massachusetts and potentially others. Important to understand that the suppliers have options for meeting their obligation. They don't have to, neither the homeowner nor the suppliers have to install or make, make transitions in any particular property, um, but they, they are incentivized to make a certain quantity of those changes every year. Um, the next slide is a carryover from last time, and I'm not gonna go through all of it because it kind of covers what I just said, but I did want to mention this kind of funnel diagram again, because the complicated part in what I said is the idea that you'd make the energy suppliers implement these clean heat solutions. Um, that's that obviously needs to be a much more specific kind of a requirement. And given the range of building types and technologies 
that could get very complicated. So the way we're envisioning the program is that there's a process by which these different types of technologies can apply to create what we're calling clean heat credits. And then the implementation of clean heat is demonstrated by holding these credits um, that, that have, have been through this application process. So that's a kind of reminder of what we mean when we say clean heat standard. We're open for comment on the details, but that's kind of the basic concept. And I, wanna, I wanted to do that just to take the framework for introducing the basic concepts related to equity and how they might be built into a standard. So next slide. So I pulled apart what we had in the stakeholder discussion document for this explanation here. We're pulling it apart into two different sections. One is the, um, the, the basic, what we're trying to achieve, what we almost what we mean by, equ by equity here. Um, and then I'll get to the mechanisms on the next slide. So the, the equity kind of, kind of, um, purpose of the mechanisms would be to benefit. We identified three different groups of people that might be benefited or, or communities. One are low and moderate income consumers, another are renters, and another group is communities that suffer from poor air quality. And so we want to kind of understand whether those are the right groups to target. And you know, as we move further, not necessarily at this stage, we'll be looking at the details of how we might define and identify those groups. There's sort of a couple different ways we identified that the mechanisms could benefit those communities. One is by supporting uh, clean heat projects, you know, most likely in those communities. So for example, installing um, non-fossil heating technologies in a community with poor air quality might help the air quality to some extent. Um, but also that we discussed in the stakeholder document that we might provide ongoing support for for low and middle income customers as part of the, the kind of equity concept in this program. Next slide. So here's where it gets a little bit complicated. And I will, I will pause right after this slide for clarification questions, but I wanted to present here the three kind of equity related mechanisms that we included in the stakeholder document and how they relate to the general structure of the program. So the three options we described is one concept would be what we call a carve out approach, where there's some, as I mentioned, some required number of clean heat credits that have to be um, shown for compliance each year. And we would simply say, for example, that half of those credits or some other um, percentage of those credits must be from projects that deliver equity benefits and defined as, you know, we have work to do on that, but located in communities that are affected by poor air quality or um, the other, other examples I gave earlier. And the, the carve out concept is kind of a term of art that we've used in some other programs. But if you follow this particular kind of equity discussions, the federal government's Justice 40 program is kind of an example of a case where you're carving out some percentage of the total amount of resources for a particular equity type of an approach. So that's one of three options we suggested. Another was a just transition fee concept. Um, and that's one where we um, recognize that some of the credits might come from projects that do reduce emissions, but don't really necessarily serve a, a, a role of forwarding equity. So for example, um, projects that earn credits in say high income communities, um, installing heat pumps at residences. And one thing we might do to address that would be to charge some sort of a fee for the registration process um, to register those, those credits and then, and then um, use some of those phone funds to support the projects that, that do, um, do support uh, equity kind of outcomes. So that's a second of three um, uh, ideas here where um, in that funneling process where you're applying for credits, there's a there's a sort of sorting between the equitable projects and, a, and a, a fee on projects that may not meet that standard. 
The third one is a little different category. Um, there's a concept that's likely to be included in the program called an alternative compliance payment, which shows a way of dealing with the possibility that maybe in some years there won't be enough credits available to comply, meaning not enough heat, heat clean heat was um, delivered as a, as a service. And in those situations, we would collect revenue through alternative compliance, and we could devote all um, or some of that revenue to um, equity purposes. We do want to have a, we did mention a caveat in the discussion document there, which is that the ACP payments only happen when there's not enough credits at a, at a low price available. So that's not necessarily a stable revenue source. So that might not be the only option. It might be combined with one or both of the other options. So the options are really compatible. We could have um, any either of them or both of them would be fine to have in the program. So that's what we're looking for comment on. If I could just move to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to stop now, and I really want to focus on clarification questions around equity mechanisms that we included in the, in the discussion document. We can have some more open discussion later, but we want to make sure people understand what we've suggested here. So I'm going to pause for a moment here for clarification questions on what I've presented so far. And as a reminder, use the raise hand function or submit written questions through the questions and answer function of Zoom. Uh, Mary, I've asked you to unmute. Uh, my first uh, clarification question begins at the definition of uh, those three, like a few slides back, how did you arrive uh, at that process of identifying those three groups that you had as, as what um, uh, the potential mechanisms to benefit low and moderate income? How did you arrive there? Because there are groups that should be there and they are missing. And other aspects uh, of this discussion that are missing. So I think we should probably just take that as a comment. We'd be happy to hear what those other groups are now or in written comment in the future. I think we these are the ones we had identified as sort of the most, you know, that we'd heard raised the most in, in discussions and and questions and um, but you know again that's the purpose of this is to get ideas so um, happy to hear from you now or or at a later time if we've left out something. So without going into the specifics of who uh, should be in that list. I think what we are lacking is a historical framework of how the whole heating uh, or cooling uh, mechanism affects environmental justice communities. That there's a piece that's missing, and and that piece is the piece that would lead us to ask ourselves when we are talking about equity, who exactly. Are we defining, uh, how exactly are we defining uh, equity as for this particular aspect of, uh, of the clean energy economy? And this meeting will not, I don't want to take too much time, but I may end up having to write something about what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful and much appreciated. So thank you. Just one comment back on that. Um, we do have designated environmental justice populations in the Commonwealth. So it sounds like you might be thinking about uh, suggesting that we, we think more about using that those designated areas as one of our as part of our groups to um, have incentives for clean heat. So that would be something we'd like to hear from you about. Uh, Barry, go ahead. 
No, no, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, that's not what I'm suggesting because what happens is that we have the perfect world of how uh, energy uh, happens in the in the Commonwealth, but the reality is that what is imagined is not what takes place. Therefore, it won't just be environmental justice uh, communities as identified. It also has to do with who has benefited from the clean. Uh, it's not a clean heat standard, but from where whatever heat standard we've been using before we arrived here. And that would mean that we need to do a little bit of digging. Okay, thank you. I noticed that Deneen has her hand raised. Maybe we should go to Deneen. Thanks, Will. Um, I've met with Mary, with uh, my outreach coordinator, and I would be happy to meet with you again, Mary, to try to figure out exactly what you're saying here and how we can make sure that those comments are incorporated into this process. Thanks, Deneen. Uh, Larry, I've asked you to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, going back to the questions of the targeted folks that we, we might want to support uh, in terms of equity, you, you mentioned low income renters and folks who are suffering poor air quality. So this is sort of a technical clarification. Um, on air quality, we can identify populations that are suffering from being proximate to um, a fossil fuel power plant. Right, we've got maps that indicate that and some data. Um, and I know everyone's working hard to work on that issue. Pretty much the same thing about folks who are proximate to uh, highways who are suffering from uh, air pollution associated with um, cars and trucks and whatnot. Do you have any sort of analysis um, that might uh, help out here about the air pollution that comes from uh, building heating, um, you know, that seems to be quite uh, disparate all over the state, of course. Is there any way to indicate what hot spots there might be that you could you could attribute it to uh, buildings rather than to power plants or to uh, transportation? Um, that's a, a fairly difficult thing to do. What we do have, Larry, is we have, a, we have our um, periodic emissions inventory that breaks down emissions at a high level throughout the state. And then we have our greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And one of the things we're doing for the cumulative impact analysis regulations is to, um, when we're requiring um, cumulative impact analysis for an air permit, we're requiring applicants to present data on a number of things, including what are some environmental facilities in the, in the area, what are they near in terms of highways, but also they're going to be presenting a lot of data on um, asthma prevalence and other um, health related indicators. So, and I think that's really um, the beginning of how we're going to be looking at um, what, you know, how to, how to pull together data um, for, for, for that process. But I think it could be a little bit, I think it could be applicable to this process too. Okay, re that's reasonable, uh, Christina. My, my hearing that, which is, doesn't surprise me, I guess I'm saying th there probably are better ways of addressing air quality or, or other policy areas. Um, you know, again, looking at uh, the regional greenhouse gas initiative for power plants, uh, right. perhaps, uh, and, and anything we can do to reduce vehicle emissions uh, to improve air quality. It seems to me that uh, real, First of all, we appreciate the fact that you're having a session about equity, and it just seems to me that, that in our viewpoint at Green Energy Consumers Alliance, we would say there definitely should be a mechanism, whether it's the uh, carve out or um, one of the other ideas that you have directed at low and moderate income folks. Thank you. Thanks for both parts of that. Yes, thanks. A uh, question from Isabella Gambill. Uh, can you please clarify if it is it will consider both indoor and outdoor air quality? So we are aware of the indoor air quality issue. I, I guess I would I would say that in in the and this is getting a little bit at Larry's question also. I think um, a particular 
thing where we know we can have benefit is when there's a case where there's too much air pollution in a particular community, then reducing fossil emissions in that community should be generally helpful. I don't know whether I have anything to add about indoor air quality, except that we're, we're happy to hear um, you know, comments on anything that we should be considering. Christine, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, the only thing I would add is that, again, when we're doing our mapping related to cumulative impact analysis, we're considering a number of factors that some are related to outdoor air pollution, but some, some are definitely related to indoor, such as like asthma prevalence. So it, it does take into account indoor air to some, to some level, but thank you for the comment. Appreciate it. Uh, Mary? Uh, I would also like to highlight the importance of energy burdens in these discussions that the same weight applied to air quality should also be the same weight applied to high energy burdens areas. Most of those areas are places where the same people that are dealing with air quality issues are also the same people that are dealing with uh, with high energy burdens. And I, I think not having energy burdens as something that's expressly identified in uh, whatever equity strategy the Commonwealth wants to have would be a, a, a gross failure. Right, so I think the question, and we really are definitely interested in common on this, is that you know there, there is a strong correlation, I think, between low and middle income customers and high energy burden. But to the extent there are ways we can improve and, and target that better, that 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 may be helpful to us. So we're happy to hear more about that. And I see something in the chat on that right now. Um, I wonder if we should push through the rest of the slides um, before we take more questions, Christine, because I'm I think we've moved a little bit past clarification at this point. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Um, we certainly have more time for questions from everyone else and comments, so keep going. And we just have a couple more slides. So, so what I've attempted to do kind of is, is tell you so far what, what we had in the discussion document and our thinking behind it. And I think, you know, I think we heard so far that there's, you know, good understanding and kind of interest in it. We also asked some particular questions about whether a carve out was a good approach. Um, how could the specific requirements be determined? So, for example, you know, I think that's a lot of the, the what I've heard so far in this meeting are sort of about how you might do that. If you want to say 50% of the credits are going to be benefit equity, then how would you actually define that? Um, another question is about um, funding new clean heat versus maybe giving some ongoing support for customers that need it. And then um, finally, how should we identify credit? So, so you know, I, you're you're giving some good comments on the things we asked about in the discussion document here, and we did we did see that in people's written comments, and we expect more of that. Uh, next slide. So I already stumbled into a little bit of an issue with this earlier in the day. It is it is a challenge we have. We do think it's helpful to people to give simple summaries of comments, but it's hard to get the perfect description of them. But we did get a lot of comments, not a lot of detail, but a lot of general comments on our equity mechanism. And I think we divided up um, maybe somewhat arbitrarily into many and few supporters. So we saw a wide you know, support among different types of commenters and different comments for the equity carve out approach and the use of the ACP revenue. We also saw strong support, though, a little bit less widespread for the just transition fee idea. And, um, you know, we would have some work to flesh that out since it's kind of a new concept. And then we also heard of a, a different concept that was raised by um, at least a couple of commenters on the idea of credit multipliers. So instead of maybe a carve out or an addition, you say that some types of projects get double or triple the credits or whatever. Um, and then the other category um, is um, what you, we might use any revenue that comes in. Um, not all the options generate revenue, but a couple of them do. And there was broad agreement around 
low and middle income households, um, you know, in particular affordable housing and bill assistance, and then also some discussion of assistance for renewable thermal. And then, you know, we are interested in Christine mentioned on, you know, whether we're missing anything here. Um, we like to think we have some good ideas, but we're always happy to hear more ideas. So if we move on to the next slide, that concludes the um, presentation and we can go back to the questioning with a focus on the equity mechanisms. And then once we've gotten through any questions on that, we do would allow some time for other topics if people have things they wanted to raise. Uh, Cindy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you all for um, holding this this meeting and evening hours too. I uh, appreciate the effort to have it be um, accessible to folks who are working nine to five. Um, I wanted to flag that you know all, all of all of these issues um, look uh, a little daunting um, from the perspective of, of equity. Um, and I appreciate very much the thinking about um, mechanisms to address equity, but I'm also wondering if there's something systemic that can be proposed um, working with other agencies, possibly the DPU, to make sure that there are ongoing affordable rates for people who are heating with electricity. Um, we know that other states are doing this. Uh, I realize this is outside the scope of what DEP is talking about here, but it seems like one of the core problems is affordability for um, people with a high energy burden, as you know, Marion Brooks have flagged. Um, certainly folks in the low and moderate income uh, categories, you know, people living in EJ communities, all of these definitions are important. And it seems like the most systemic approach to um, making sure that people can afford to keep their, their residences heated um, is critical. I, I know that in some of our work um, with the equity um, working group with the EEAC, uh, we've seen that it's hard to convince people even with transitional support to install um, heat pumps, for example, that the people with low and moderate income are not at all convinced that they can afford electric bills month after month after month, um, per particularly during the heating season, less so during the cooling season, but particularly during the heating season um, with um, the, the rate structure that we have currently. So I just wanted to flag that, that, that if there are systemic approaches in addition to these particular policy tools that we'd be really interested in, in looking at those. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave my comments there uh, for now, but there's, if we have more time, there's also the definition of clean heat that I think is really critical to get into to make sure that this transition is actually getting us to clean. So I'll, I'll hold comments for now on that. Just want to say one thing, Cindy, thank you for your comment. Um, I, I, we have a brand new DPU um, chair and, and, a, and another member too. So we flagged this issue, but I want to assure you that we are in conversations with other agencies as we design this, and I think DPU and DOER and other agencies are um, critical to the design of this. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Christine. It's, you know, it really just seems like a, a, a critically important time to be doing that coordination. So I love hearing that. Thank you. Kyle. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question about the previous slide, um, you know, the designations between many and few there. Um, uh, under just transition fee, that's listed as a few. Um, and I was wondering if these designations were done basically based upon overall volume of like number of letters, um, because, you know, we submitted a sign on letter with, uh, you know, 36, I think it was, um, co signers. Who uh, who supported a just transition fee, and so you know that that that's quite a, quite a number of them. 
I think I think where that I I think that's fair, and I you know apologize if we that that was what I had in mind when maybe the slide wasn't perfect. I, I think I think we do think that the support for the other two mechanisms was more widespread and maybe fleshed out a little more in some of the comments. So we did want to make that distinction, but I I think I'm ready to concede the few maybe isn't the right word there for the just transition fee and certainly we we do we are we are very aware appreciative of the number of groups that signed that letter and it certainly has made an impression on us so i, I certainly um you know apologize if this gives a different impression uh Aladine? Great. Um, thank you. And thank you for hosting two meetings today. I apologize for speaking with my video off. Um, but we also really appreciate you hosting a session focused on equity and that this would be a theme to discuss early and then spread throughout the rest of the conversations. A few preliminary thoughts will follow up with some written comments too, but I do appreciate that we're separating kind of the idea of cost and affordability. There's a difference between cost and then the distribution of costs and those impacts on energy burdens. I also appreciate that we're looking at, you know, recipients of benefits as a way of defining equity. I also just wanted to flag with a program of this scale. I wonder, you know, thinking about what is the framework for defining if the program overall is equitable, if we can work in issues like impact on workforce and transition to green jobs might be a component that we can integrate. Um, and then a few smaller points, and I think I'm echoing what other people have said too, again, Having, say, lower moderate income households, people with high energy burdens as early recipients of benefits, I think is important as long as we make sure we're pairing with safety mechanisms in case costs do go up, you know, by adding the capability of air conditioning or higher costs of electricity. And that is one of the places where I think coordination across programs in the state will be important because not all of those financial benefits will come through the clean heat standard. And then just the question I had was on the idea of, sorry, the fee for certain types of projects that don't address equity. If those are, my apologies to the dog, if those are going to utilities where costs are gonna be passed on to the wider ratepayer base anyway, and then kind of get work back into everybody's fees, or if that's focused more on delivery companies that pass on their rates just to the direct customers, so just maybe something to think about and what that mechanism would look like. So again, I'll stop now, but thank you for your time. Yeah, I think those are good um, analytical questions. And we, and we do have work to do, you know, as we flesh out in more detail, the details of the program as far as analysis. And we did flag in the, in the discussion document, the need for additional economic analysis, particularly focused on equity. The, the one, one thing, I, one comment I will make is that um, the 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 clean energy and climate plan plan process um, did do some analysis of the overall impacts and and implications for the broader transition to clean heat, and so to some extent we don't want to sort of reinvent the wheel on those and focus on you know the particular things around the clean heat standards. So I, I think your your comment about sort of how the pop costs are, are passed through and that sort of thing is, is very much something we're gonna need to work on as we go forward. And, and you know, I, I think what we're, what we're we, we hear, you know, the combined comments about, um, you know, the need to acknowledge um, the bottom line costs on people's um, um, energy bills and, you know, that ideally, and, you know, I think will be addressed, you know, across various programs, but we did wanna just, get out ahead of that and make clear that, you know, we would like to, if possible, build as much of that as we can into this program, but it, it certainly can't be a, uh, you know, solve all those problems that within this, this program that, that need to be other complementary sorts of things going on or, or even primary things going on. Mary? Uh Mine is is a is a question on on the revenue uses. What do you mean by renewable thermal? Well, we had a comment letter. I think that um, renewable thermal, I think, is is um, some is, is substitutes for 
um, natural gas or, or heating oil that are um, come from renewable feedstocks. And I think one of the commenters um, pointed out there are cases where those are available at relatively low cost um, and that those uh, you know, might be something to consider as you think about economic equity. Um, so I think that's what that one was getting at. Uh, okay, so I wanted to add something, another angle of revenue uses. So utility uh, and energy as it exists today has always been uh, a little bit more extractive instead of, I mean, it extracts from communities instead of building them. And my suggestion is that the carve-outs should actually include or consider thinking of a clean energy uh, ownership of distributed generation in, in environmental justice communities, not just, not just having the, like the plant there, but for the community to benefit in terms of ownership and jobs. And that could be a good use of, uh, of I mean, of, of, of revenue. Uh, and then something else I wanted to highlight is, I mean, we've for a long time, uh, Massachusetts has, ha has struggled a lot with energy data and transparency. And I wonder if uh, that's something that will be, uh, I, I don't know where that fits in, in the carve outs, but uh, there should be, uh, an emphasis on da data tracking and transparency. And then finally, this is the only thing I'm gonna say, I won't speak again. <laughs> Equity is not just a section of, of the clean heat standard. Equity is everything. It affects everybody. And I'm hoping that the Commonwealth and others that are involved in this work will not see equity as a part, it is the section, it's everything. Thank you. Yeah, and I should say we, we agree with that. And that's one of the reasons why when we wrote the discussion document, we didn't have a separate section on equity, but we took these, we, 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 we identified these three things and, and put them you know, in, directly in the parts of the, the program where they would really fit because we wanted to make clear that these are ideas not for making the program that otherwise wouldn't be equitable, equitable, but for making a program that builds in equity right from the, the start of the program. Um, I'd also mention one thing that has come up in the past and we didn't get into this, that's equity related. Um, you know, our, our programs often have a program review component. And I think, I think you're right to, to identify related to equity that you know, we, we you should there. We we have a responsibility to kind of make sure that not just that you know funding is being spent in these ways, but actually what's being delivered at the community and income level um, um, area. So I think you know having monitoring and transparency toward that is something that's very much on our minds. I just want to add one thing here, and I, I appreciate the comments, Mary. Um, all I want to add is that we're really out front on this issue. No, no other part of the country is doing something quite like this. And uh, again, our commitment is to build an equity. We have a lot of eyes on us, and we, we want to get it right. But I think Will's point about program review—it's been a—it's been a really important tool for us to design a program, get a program up and running, and then be able to hone it when we when we get more experience as we implement. But our goal is to to um, make sure that we are addressing equity in the design right now. So thank you for your comments, I appreciate it. Anita. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I wanna say, I, I love Mary's idea about distributed generation. I think it's very much under, under pushed. And um, I love um, Cindy's pointing out that we need to define what clean heat is. And I would say that one very blanket statement is that clean heat doesn't burn. So if you talk about renewable thermal, I think you're talking about networked geothermal. Otherwise, you're talking about renewable fuels, which I don't think are clean. 
I want to uh, I want to put forward a, a, another category along with uh, carving out and the ACP and um, the other, and that is targeting the areas that are most affected by uh, dirty heat. And it sounds like my guess is that even as you talk about high traffic areas and you know, neighborhoods that are have air pollution due to traffic, maybe you're judging that based on the number of cars that go through. Maybe you're not actually measuring it. Maybe all measures are very indirect, as indirect as your asthma being the way of measuring indoor air pollution. I don't think that's smart climate work uh, going forward. From this point forward, I think we need to actually target the built the kinds of buildings that are doing the greatest indoor air pollution, health impacts. I mean, we pay for that all over the place in climate warming, in you know, healthcare costs. To be smart about it at this point, we need to find methods of getting more direct measurement and targeting the places that are um, where making reductions would make the biggest difference. So I, I recommend thinking in terms of direct measurement and targeted um, uh, conversions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cindy. Thank you. Um, I wanted to emphasize the point that um, I think um, it was made earlier by, was it Aladine? Um, I'm trying to to remember and hoping I'm not butchering that pronunciation. Um, how um, we stage and time the support for um, those with big energy burdens for low moderate income folks is uh, is really important. I know um, there's been a lot of attention and and sort of contingency planning about what happens if you know we we have a a program that doesn't quite hit the mark here and that. Uh, the majority of folks that are still on um, fossil fuel heat have escalating prices. And what if they are the ones least capable of paying? Um, I think having some forethought about making sure that that doesn't happen by making sure that those folks are considered in a first tier of, of a policy intervention as opposed to a later tier, I think um, is something that really deserves some attention. So I just wanted to plus one that and, um, you know, make, make sure that we're, you know, being real about that worst of all possible outcomes here. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say, I think that is, you know, the spirit of what the carve out concept is intended to get at. I, I realize there's still a risk of underperformance there. But that, that's what the, the basic concept was. And so fleshing out what gets targeted with that is kind of the, the, the see, I think I'm hearing support for that. And then sort of fleshing that out is, I think, the challenge we have going forward. And a lot of great ideas on that tonight. So thank you for that. Larry? Yes, I want to come back to the three mechanisms. Um, our organization's had a lot of experience over the years, uh, 20 years watching the renewable portfolio standard and all its variants. Um, and when, when you see how that's constructed for the electricity sector, it's inevitable that you're gonna have alternative compliance payments. Um, I can't imagine how you, you could design something and anticipate the market so well. Um, it's, it's no reflection on your design. You're gonna have alternative compliance payments. And, and uh, given that, I think that's a vehicle where that will essentially be cash flowing into uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That absolutely should be dedicated to, uh, in my viewpoint, to low and moderate income folks. It's something you can control. You can find the right projects that serve low and moderate income people um, and can sort of bank on that, if you will. So if you, if you consider that, um, then intuitively, I come to the conclusion that the carve out makes a makes perfect sense, which is, that's also like in the RPS, you could have a separate ACP for that. Um, if there was a failure to meet the carve out, 
um, that money would flow into the coffers to serve low and moderate income people. So you could ensure that we're not leaving that population uh, behind. Um, the just transition fee really intrigues me, I would say. Um, but I, I think I need more, I think you need a, I'd like to see more in writing in that, in that because uh, if you think that you can have um, a tripod of those three things and make everything work so you've got, you touch the basis for equity, then I guess I would be in favor, but I'm not sure that if you, if you do a good, I'm not sure that we need three, we certainly need two. Um, and it seems to me it should be at least the ACP because you, can, you can't avoid it. And either the carve out or the just transition fee. I, I, I would worry about the, if you only went with the just transition fee and not the carve out that, uh, how that would work. I, I, I would like to see the market work a little bit to make sure low and moderate income people are taken care of. So um, sort of I'm, I am leaning towards belt suspenders and something else to make sure it all gets done. Yeah, I will, I will say that one of the conclusions of the Clean Heat Commission, I think that they agreed on that was that the carve out concept, although they, they sort of didn't endorse it in general, they thought for equity purposes, it really was important because it's the only one of the options that basically says that something in particular you know, has to happen. It, do, it does have the alternative compliance fee component, but other than that, it, it is a way of, of not just saying we're going to devote resources toward this, but that it's built, as somebody said, into the basic structure of the program that for compliance to happen, it, 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 it has to include that. So that's kind of our thinking about that one. Thank you. Carrie? Hello. Um, I was just kind of interested because I saw that you have renters down as one of the uh, obviously groups to think about when it comes to equity, which I think makes sense. But does specifically focusing on renters mean um, having finding a way to tackle the um, kind of market failure that happens when you have renters that pay for heat? But landlords that control the building, and are you thinking of any ways to deal with that issue if you're focusing on renters? Yeah, I, th I think I have at this point the least kind of good answer on what the solution to the rental problem is, but I, I think your question made me think of a good way to explain what the list of potential beneficiaries earlier was getting at, which is that I think there's there's a risk with a market program that it, you know, the market doesn't choose the outcomes that would be equitable or meet some other goal. And so I think the renters and low and middle income customers and communities that are suffering from air pollution are kind of the examples of the things that um, might, might, we might find if we didn't think about them early on that the program you know, hadn't served in the way it should. I, I think that, um, you know, there is obviously some correlation between the renters and the low and modern income category, um, but that that is one that, um, you know, there's a little more to the question than there are for the other two, I guess is, is kind of your your point. And I, I, we, don't, we haven't solved that problem yet, but it's a good thing to flag. I'm not seeing any raised hands or questions in the Q&A or chat right now. I think we can wait another minute or so and then. Yeah, just just um, while we wait, um, I think this has been a great discussion. I want to reiterate, we are taking comments at any time at the Climate Strategies web, excuse me, um, email that you see here. We are holding um, technical sessions next week and get into a deeper dive on a number of our technical issues. Um, so again, great, great, great conversation. We heard a lot of good comments tonight, which is exactly what we, what we wanted. So thank you. We'll, I guess we'll, we'll leave it open for another minute or so and then we'll wrap and we'll, uh, we'll end for the evening. Uh, Cindy? Thank you. Um, 
I just uh, wanted to add one final point um, about equity. Um, and for us, um, it includes environmental justice as well as economic justice. Um, we are watching across the country as so-called chemical recycling facilities are being promoted um, that are high heat incineration of plastics and then you know, working to pelletize and um, separate out some of the chemical streams in the plastics. Um, often these facilities are being proposed for environmental justice communities. So um, I just wanted to add in that as we're thinking about equity, um, really defining clean heat to, um, you know, as has been proposed to not include certainly combustion of potentially toxic streams and, um, you know, combustion in general creates pollution. And there's far too great a, a track record of these facilities being targeted towards environmental justice communities. Um, so it would, you know, it would be our greatest hope that what we're talking about here are non-combustion sources of, of heat and particularly not um, uh, chemical recycling or so-called advanced recycling that takes plastic components and, you know, works to combust them again. So just um, uh, since we wrapped up the economic equity issues, I wanted to make sure and just underscore that environmental equity point. Thank you. I'm not seeing any additional hands or comments in the chat. I think we can wrap up for the evening. Thank you everybody again for joining.